So um, the first killer whale that was like technically captured was named Wanda and it was in 1961, I want to say. So it was in the 60s and it really did originate um, in North America, um, sadly, a lot of times. It's weird that like it started here, but a lot of people don't think about captivity starting in the Pacific Northwest because we think about how they turned to Iceland afterwards. And now Russia still does captures. 1960s, they first captured um, Wanda. And then there was like Namu, a bunch of other whales. um, And that's when sea parks kind of started to pop up. There was Sealand of the Pacific, which is talked about in um, the documentary. But SeaWorld San Diego and other SeaWorld parks also open. And a book I recommend to learn about the Pacific Northwest captures is Puget Sound Whales for Sale. Um, It goes really, it's by Sandra Pollard. Um, It goes really into depth about each of these captures and just how catastrophic they were to the populations out here. For example, um, the Southern Residents is one of those populations. They were caught. pretty heavily. Um, There is like the infamous Penn Cove captures that happened um, over near Whitby in Washington. And I have some of the statistics of it. I mean, it takes just a lot of genetic diversity out of the population just in general, you know, like you're taking- And that's that's the main issue. Potential breeders basically out of the population. And I mean, they kind of talk about it in the documentary too, how it was seen as like, we were like sea cowboys, you know, like it was this almost fun thing in a way like and obviously the person that testament that submitted testimony about um his experience as one of those captors feels very remorseful about it now or at least appeared to in the documentary um but at the time and even even he says it he's like it was kind of like I didn't realize what I was doing even until after I heard like the rest of that pod calling out for their baby that we had just taken kind of thing. Yeah. And so through that between, so 45 Southern resident killer whales were captured and delivered to Marine parks between 1965 and 1973, 1970 is like the well-known infamous Penn Cove capture. Their population has never fully recovered and we can't credit that this is what gave them a demise um, because there are so many other factors that, Are leading to their problem but yeah it it decreased their genetic diversity if nothing it, um, it just probably didn't help it didn't and one thing we, we we see now with the southern residents is there have been two males um since the 90s primarily that have fathered at least half of the calves and so what that does is when there isn't a lot of genetic diversity if like someone gets sick and everyone has a similar gene and it knocks them out you know they're all innately weakened to that that illness or whatever right. and that's the fear um now 53 total southern residents were taken between 1965 and 1986 13 were known killed during that time um and they kind of talk about how they'd take the babies is that out of the 53 or that's an addition to the 50 it's separate okay um or maybe it's part of it i don't remember i'm looking at this um so so it's a lot i didn't even it's a lot i mean I guess well, and then- their population was estimated to be at 120 before the captures. So 53, so that's about about half. 50% of their population was mm-hmm. estimated, which is pretty insane. I think yeah. too, at least for me, obviously when you think about how many parks there are out there in the US, let alone outside of the US, there's obviously like a lot of whales in captivity. Yes. At least 53, you know. But yeah. I, but that number is so when you when you say that number like 53 were taken from that population I don't know why that just seems like a lot like it is and that's just the southern residents they also took from the northern residents um and the other killer populations in that area um before they moved to Iceland to capture because it ended up getting banned right and they kind of talk about that in the documentary um like 1976 ish is when they basically passed that bill and there was a big push from SeaWorld to not ban that to the point where they actually during shows would stop the show or whatever. And the trainer would basically say that the U.S. is trying to ban um, us being able to collect 
killer whales. That this hurts insane. us as a park. And they would give people pre-stamped letters and envelopes to send to say they don't support the banning of this. Um, That's pretty gnarly. <laughs> I, f- I learned this in August of this year, or like, I guess 2020. And I was mad. I was like, are you kidding me? It's just I mean, like, oh. to be fair, it was a long time ago. It was. And it's it, like people had a very... <laughs> And to the point like that the documentary made, we didn't know that much about orcas at the time. It was kind of, I mean, they even like sort of, it. there was like this parallel almost to like sharks in a way. Yeah. Um, like they were showing clips of the movie like Orca and <laughs> which like kind of parallels Jaws almost in a way where it's like a yeah. oh, big scary well, there was... like, black monster of the sea kind of thing. Yeah. There was some like, I don't want to say there's benefits to the captures, but we did end up, this is when um, people did start to kind of study killer whales. Mm -hmm. This is when the ID programs for transients, the bigs whales, um, and the southern residents did start up. So now we can look back and we can kind of start to look um, at the images that we have of the captures um, and start to like kind of ID individuals. That's how we know um, Lolita or Tokate. She is a member of El Pod. She now lives at Miami Seaquarium. She is like 100% Southern resident. She was taken from this Pen Cove capture in 1970 and we have pictures of it. Um, and we know who her family is in the wild now. Um, so there was stuff like we did kind of start to learn about yeah, and whales. When I wrote that paper, when I was back in college too, that was kind of one of the big points that I did make because SeaWorld has published some research related stuff. Um, I think the struggle as now being a researcher myself and understanding a little bit more about that process um, is you're studying a captive population that's not necessarily going to exhibit the same behaviors or just the same tendencies that a wild population would. They are either about captives that only apply to captive killer whales or they're Mm -hmm. about captive whales that you can't really apply everything to wild whales. Now there are things like we can kind of credit they helped with. Um, one is for a long time, we struggled to tell like if a female was pregnant. One, we didn't have drones to really right. get an aerial the, image. The technology that we have now makes a lot of research so much easier. Yeah, and so there is like, we could have figured that out, but they did help with the measurements of their females being like, oh, this is like how big they might get. Um, and using that when you're looking at a wild whale and watching kind of like their right. body size. That is one that in the parks they will they will talk about that they helped do that. Again, you can kind of be like, oh well, I think we could have figured that out on our own. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the hard part. But I think too, like you're looking for a reason to justify it in a way in your own yeah. mind. You know, yeah. like as someone that works there, I'm sure you're looking for whatever. Because I, I truly believe that nobody that works at SeaWorld, at least as trainers and stuff is maliciously like keeping oh, whales. Well, yes. You know what I mean? Right. Like they, they genuinely yeah. care about the animals. Um, and so I th- I'm sure there's some degree of convincing yourself that like what the organization you work for is doing is good and all that kind of stuff. Um, when it's kind of, it's like when, you, when you're there and like you're watching kids fall in love with an animal, they do share a lot of knowledge in shows now. And they know a lot about, yeah, t- like training a killer whale. Mm-hmm. Um, but you also are like seeing kids fall in love and like ask questions like that. Also, I'd be like, that's worth it. Like, what about what if those kids were me and you and we went on to do marine, right. like marine science? For sure. Um And I mean, that's a whole conversation we can have just about captivity in general, about like how there's really good benefits to it as well as not so good benefits or not so great things about it. Um, But yeah, but yeah, so I guess just like historically, obviously, and they talk about it in the documentary is that there wasn't, people didn't have the same sentiment towards orcas or just even honestly the ocean, I feel like that people do now. And part of that came because we didn't understand it all that much. Um, And we've learned so much about animals in the wild as well as in captivity at this point um yeah but it's definitely it's interesting to hear kind of that historical perspective because I think people a lot of times assume that oh they knew it was this horrible thing right off the bat and quite honestly I mean obviously we weren't there we can't speak to that but I'm sure at the time it they didn't understand how intelligent and how 
human-like, you know, situations yeah. can really be. Um, and we've learned a lot just since then that's kind of given us a better perspective of like, hmm, maybe this isn't the greatest thing. 